Make your way to John 21. We're going to talk about the text. We're going to talk about a few other things. And then we're going to come back to that text to close us out today. So you'll need it uh, throughout. (sighs) Aren't you grateful for God's love? And I, I, I just feel it. And I feel it more and more the older I get and the more experiences I have in life and the, the, the where the journey takes me, I, I'm more and more grateful for God's love. And so uh, in reflecting on that, I just started going through my Bible and, and noting some of my favorite passages on love. And I'm going to share some of those with you today. Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding. In steadfast love. Abounding. Of course John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us. God always shows his love. God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners. Not after we got our lives cleaned up. Not after we did a lot of religious things. While we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And then uh, the great conclusion to the great 8th chapter of Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, It seems like a lot of things might. Paul says, shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Then he quotes the Old Testament. For your sake we're being put to death all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. There's so many things so hard in this life. So many obstacles. So many challenges. Will those things separate us from the love of Christ? He says, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than overcomers through him who loved us. For I am sure, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are safe and secure in the love of God. God loves you. And I don't know what your experience has been this week. I don't know. Some of you have gone through some pretty hard things. I know some of your stories this week. You came in uh, battle weary and worn. God loves you. The God that created the universe loves you. And don't ever, don't ever doubt it. Don't ever stray from it. Don't ever, don't ever run from the love of God. Neglect the love of God. Forget the love of God. He loves you. Now, as I was pondering that, first thing that popped into my head was an old song. And uh, it is uh, a song with a pretty good question to it. Penetrating first verse. I am satisfied with Jesus is the name of the... Him, many of you know that. I am satisfied with Jesus. He has done so much for me. He suffered to redeem me. He died to set me free. Then he hit the chorus. I am satisfied. I am satisfied. By the way, don't you hate those repetitive hymns? (laughs) I am satisfied. I am satisfied. I am satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me, as I think of Calvary, is my master satisfied with me? Oh, I know I can be satisfied with him. Is he satisfied with me? So you tie those things together. I had to think about it. Well, I can say with confidence, God loves, loves me. I have plenty of evidence of it, plenty of experience of it over a long time walking with him. But the question comes to me, as I think of Calvary, the place where Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin... Does he, does he know, is he sure that I really love him? Would the Lord's testimony about me, about you be, they love me. I know they love me. John chapter 21. It is one of, uh, it's a, the whole chapter dedicated to this. It's one of several incidences following the resurrection of Christ. He's raised from the dead. He appears to his disciples periodically over the next 40 days, the Bible tells us. However, he's not with them constantly. He's not always there. He appears in a moment in divine appointments, sometimes with small groups, sometimes larger groups. At one time, we're told over 500 people at once 
But he appears for purpose of special teaching, special encouragement, to do some things that really need to happen and move the ball down the field. And so this is one of those times, John chapter 21. Now, last week, Jimmy talked about the resurrection of Christ, what it means to us, what it means for us, the victory of, of, of a risen Savior. John chapter 20 concludes with that last verse where, and we have been saying this from the first week of the series and several times in between. John says, okay, so man, Jesus raised from the dead. He died on the cross, paid for sin. Now he's raised from the dead. And he says, here's the whole reason I wrote this book. These things are written. You may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believing, you might have life in his name. Believe, believe, believe. Again, over almost 100 times, uh, Jesus, uh, in John's gospel, we find the word believe. That's the reason this book exists. You might believe. And it seems like when, when you get to that last verse, John 20, verse 31, it's like that ties it up with a bow and we are done. That's the dun 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 pow and... All done with this story of Jesus in John's gospel. But we still get chapter 21. And some Bible scholars have come to believe, well, it must just be a, it was added on later on. You know, it was added in the early second century. Someone else tagged that on. And, uh, but truth be told, there's not an example where it hasn't been there in the gospel of John. It was always present in our uh, ancient manuscripts. It's it's reliable. It's a part of the story. And I think we need chapter 21. We talk about believing. The disciples believed. But the question that chapter 21 tries to address is, so what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do with your belief? How are you going to respond to this? And Is there evidence of your belief by the life that you're living? What does belief look like in the priorities of what you do with your time, your talent, your treasure? The chapter opens, chapter 21 opens, we won't read the whole chapter. Some of these I've read the whole chapter. This chapter we won't. It starts out setting there by the Sea of Galilee. There's seven disciples, five of them are named, two of them are unnamed. But they're all Galilean disciples. They have grown up by the sea. They are accustomed to the fishing business that drove the economy around those, the villages that surrounded the Sea of Galilee. And they are there again. And Peter says, you wonder, they're just sit, all sitting, sitting around looking at each other. What are we supposed to do now? What's up next? And Peter says, I'm going fishing. And they said, well, we'll go with you. And they climbed in a boat, and the kind of fishing they did was shallow water fishing at night with nets. And they go out, and they fish all night, and they don't catch anything. And it may be, may just be uh, getting around to, to daybreak, still a little hard to see things. And someone on the shore says, why don't you, why don't you fish on the other side of the boat? Okay, now honestly, how many of you fishermen out there in a moment of fishing drought have said, you know, I've been casting on this side of the boat for a good while and nothing's happening. I've been dropping a line on this side and there is a biblical precedent for this. I'm going to now try it over here. It's never worked for me, but I know. And also, is there always some guy who yells at you, you know what you need to do? This is why you're not catching fish. I always love that guy. They have no idea who this is. He says, why don't you cast your net on the other side of the boat? And they decide, that, well, we'll do it. And all of a sudden, the nets are about to break because of what they're catching. Now, the kind of fish that they typically caught were more sardine size. They were small fish. This time it's big fish. It's more the tilapia uh, variety of fish you, you can find today in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, big fish. And as good fishermen, what do they do? They count them. There were 153 of them. That's a good fishing day. Uh, a little more than expected. Now, everything's going great. They got this big haul of fish. And John, his heart is so warm to Christ. He's so tuned into him all the time, it seems like. It's John that says, it's the Lord. That's the guy on the beach. Well, impulsive, 
impetuous Peter, he just bails out of the boat. He swims to shore, and they all come in, they pull in their fish, and, and Jesus already has a fire going, and he's already cooked breakfast for them, and has everything, because you know what? Jesus has fed them before, and he's going to feed them again. And then he spends a little one-on-one -on -one time with Peter. And I want to start in verse 15. Here's what God's Word says, John 21, verse 15. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John. A very formal way to address someone so close. Do you love me? Now, Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And, and Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress uh, yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, we've learned through the Gospel of John, he's talking about John. That's how John refers to himself in his own story of Jesus. He saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Aren't we always worried about what's going to happen to everybody else? Deflecting... Uh, when things are hot for us. What about that guy? Oh, I'm better than him. Where does he fall in the scheme of things? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he'd not die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there were also, this is a good summary statement, now there are also many other things Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Oh, there's so much more. But, as he finished the last chapter, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. And that is why this book exists. Now, in, in this book, Peter has been fed again. Jesus has fed him before, miraculously, the feeding of the 5,000, miraculously, feeding of the 4,000. He, he asked Peter three times, do you love me, to give him three times to affirm his love for Christ, just as he had denied Christ three times. And, man, that part of this story, this is such an uncomfortable, awkward, we tend to avoid uncomfortable and awkward uh, conversations. Jesus jumps into awkward, uncomfortable, both feet. And how, how uncomfortable this was for Peter, knowing his denial. But this is the grace of God. I some of you, you say, I, I, I've just messed up too much. I've fallen too far. I've drifted. I've made such dumb mistakes. I'm... My broken is too broken for God to do anything with me. And, and yet this is the grace of God that he reaches out to us in the things that are broken about us in us. And he restores and he renews and he doesn't give up on us and he calls us back. And with, uh, with Peter, he says, follow me. Because that's how this whole thing started with Peter. When he called him originally, he said, follow me. And he dropped everything and followed him. Now, at the end of Jesus' public ministry, he's again, follow me. Just follow me. Because I have a mission for you, and it's a mission of making disciples. Jesus uh, has this uncomfortable conversation. 
asking Peter three times to affirm his love. And uh, think about why, why Peter gets so much press in chapter 21. Because uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. But he told Jesus in the upper room, I'll never deny you. And it says, and the rest of the disciples said the same. Uh, with uh, the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, we have this story that, man, Peter, Peter ran and so did the rest of the disciples. We have this story, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the rest said, well, we'll go with you. Because whatever Peter's doing, the rest are going to follow. His leadership is so strong. Jesus has to nail him down in his commitments. He has to get him focused. He has to make sure he can lead well in the days to come, uh, these other believers. Because they're going to watch him. They're going to listen to him. They're going to follow him. So Jesus is guiding in chapter 21 through this discipling process. Because Jesus has never done making a disciple. And there are things he wants to build into Peter, things he wants to build into me, things he wants to build into you until he comes again or I go to meet him. He's going to keep on in probably a long time in eternity. He's still going to be banging away at the rough edges of me. Jesus had this conversation. Now, there are several contrasting Greek words. Some of you are familiar with some of this. And uh, commentators have found that in the Greek words, sometimes there's not a lot of difference in how they're utilized in Greek literature. But there is, it's still worth noting here. Peter denied Jesus three times. Now he asked three times, do you love me? And Jesus likes to use the word uh, agape, which is the kind of love God has. The kind of love that's not based on feeling, but based on commitment and action. The will. It's the kind of love that God has for his people. When God so loved the world, he loved with an agape kind of love. And, and here's what happens is that he, Jesus says his first couple of times, he says, hey, do you love me? Agape. And he says, well, of course I love you, phileo. Which is uh, you know, Philadelphia, uh, city of brotherly love. I love you like a brother. Man, have you ever, uh, some of you in a dating relationship at some point in your life, you ever think, this is getting really serious. I'm not sure where this relationship's going to go. And uh, you, 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 all right, well, I love you, I love you. And then they, they respond, I think you're pretty special too. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. That did not go well. You know, you use a big goose egg hanging out there now. And uh, you, you want to you wait and apply that one at the right time because it is an awkward situation if it does not get returned to you. Oh, I like you too. Mm, that hurt, right? Some of you have been in that awkward situation. Jesus throws out a big love. And, and Peter basically says, of course I like you, buddy. Especially when we're doing stuff together. And the things you do for me, I mean, I, I really appreciate all that. I, you're my pal. Simon, son of John, do you really love me? When Jesus is using that word, it's the same word that shows up in that uh, definition of love from 1 Corinthians 13. And in, when, Paul, when Paul uses the that agape word in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter in the Bible. He says there's certain things that love does and certain things love does not do. And he, he, he lists things. He said that agape kind of love is, is patient and kind. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. It endures all things. In contrast, that agape kind of love does not envy, does not boast, does not rejoice when things are wrong. It's not arrogant, not rude, not selfish, not irritable, not resentful. And that agape kind of love doesn't end. It doesn't just at some point factor out. He's reaching out and teaching that loving him, loving Jesus is something you do. We talked about this with the kids. It's something that hap there's something that happens. Love that's love in agape way is not ever a feeling. It's not ever a a general disposition of like it 
It is a commitment that is expressed in action. Something happens. Now, I wanted to paint as clear a picture as I could and to find a different way to say this than we've talked about before. And uh, What does love look like? And uh, going through my files, and I'm filing stuff every day and digging back through them looking for things. So when it came to love, I went through my love file and I found this and been buried under a lot of stuff for a long time. It's something that J.C. Ryle, in, who died in 1900, the pastor, he died in 1900, but he was describing what love looks like. And I'm going to use his questions, his, his, his examples of this is love, okay? So I want you to put this in the context of do you love Jesus and see how this looks? Because he's just talking about love in general. Specifically, he's using an illustration of a person. If you love a person... And most of us would say, oh, there's a person that I love. I love my wife. I love my husband. I love my kids. I love my parents. I love this dear friend. So you, you have examples that you would apply the word love to. So this is our outline. If we love a person, we like to think about it. Isn't that true? You like to think about him. You don't need to be reminded of him. You don't forget his name. You don't forget what he looks like. You don't forget, forget what's important to him. You, you remember his opinions and tastes and positions and what he does for a living. And that person comes up in your mind's eye multiple times in the course of a day. I love my wife. I don't have to try to remember things about her because they're all fresh in my mind because I love her very much. And that's, that's what love looks like in any human relationship. And so, for a true Christian, you don't have to be reminded that you have a crucified master. You don't have to be reminded. You're thinking about him all day. You don't, for, you don't forget his day, the Lord's day. You, you don't forget his cause, the gospel. You don't forget his people, the church, not for a, not for a season, not for a day. The true Christian, your thoughts going to... Jesus is going to pop up in your thoughts every day and throughout the day. Because one simple reason. You love Jesus. That's what love looks like. You see this in other relationships. It ought to be that way with Jesus. If we love a person, don't you like to hear about him? I, I, was, I was back from a conversation a few weeks ago. And somebody mentioned somebody that's a dear friend of mine. And I just inserted myself into the conversation. I haven't. How's he doing? I haven't talked to him in a long time. What's going on in his life? Where is he still here? What's to catch me up on this person that I just hadn't hadn't caught anything in a while about him? When we hear about someone, what they what they've what they've said, what they're doing, what their plans are, you're interested in that. For a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ who loves Jesus, don't don't you want to hear about Jesus, Ryle? In his ministry, he, he, uh, he's bouncing uh, across what is now Great Britain with his ministry. He told a story about an old Welsh believer, an older woman, used to walk several miles every Sunday to go to church. And, and it really impressed uh, Ryle. He said, she'd walk several miles to go to church. But here's the thing about this woman. She didn't speak any English. She didn't understand anything going on in the service, except she could recognize one word in the pastor's sermon, Christ. Uh, it was the same in, in her uh, Welsh dialect, Welsh language. And so she was asked, why do you walk several miles to come to a service where you, you, you really don't understand anything going on? And she said, because the pastor in his sermons names the name of Christ so many times, it just does my heart good. She loved even hearing the name of Jesus being spoken. If we love a person, don't you like to read about him? I want you to climb into your Wayback Machine and uh, do some remembering with me, those of you who are capable of this. So, I was engaged to Rhonda at a time when there was no email. No email computer no uh, and 
for the year before we, after we were engaged, we got married. There was a 12 months past with her in Abilene, Texas, and me in Fort Worth, Texas, both of us going to school. It was a very long distance between the two of us, and it was an expensive, long, how many of you remember a long distance call? Uh, yeah, there you go. You know why? Because you're old too. That's why you remember a long distance call. And so, you remember, it's, it was expensive to make those calls, so you couldn't do that. So we wrote love letters. Any of you love letter writers out there? Do a little of that, yeah. And I would write several a week, and she would write several back. And I'm pretty sure at the apartment where I was living, that mailman, he just had the big box of boxes, and he'd crack that thing open and just throw that in there carelessly. No tenderness. But at the end of my work day, I went to school in the morning, worked into the evening, and Get home and go check that box. And when I open it up, oh, there it was. The flutter in my heart. There it was. Take it out tenderly. <laughs> Rhonda put a drop of, drop of her perfume on those letters. Carefully open it. And I would, I would read it. And when I finished reading it, I'd just read it again. Because <laughs> I love reading anything she wrote. Hearing what she had to say. What she wanted to communicate. What was going on in her life. Oh my. I love reading. And... And I would keep those letters. In fact, we have a box of those letters that we try to hide from the rest of the public. But, <laughs> but when it comes to me and my Savior, man, this morning, just open up this book. Oh, what does he have to say to me today? I have read this book dozens of times from cover to cover. But I reread this book. And a freshness comes to me when I read this book again. And a warmth sweeps over me when I open God's Word. I delight in this book. And you know why? Because I love my Savior. And some of you know what that feels like, what that looks like to, 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 to walk with your Savior. And you've experienced so much with Him. And you love Him so much. And you just want, you want to read about Him. We love if we love a person, don't we, like to, don't we like to please them? Now, when, when someone that we love is around, we, we know there's certain things that they don't want to eat. Well, we don't go to, say, hey, let's go where I want to eat instead of where you want to eat. When I love somebody, I, where do you? Let's go where you want to eat. Let's, let's do what you want to do. What, what, would, what would bring joy to you today that I want to please that person and I'll deny myself. I'll deny, you know, my wishes, my wants. Someone that especially I don't get to see all the time that <clears throat> we have opportunity to be together. Man, uh, I'll give up my natural inclinations to do what brings them pleasure. Folks come in from out of town just, you want to do it that way? Well, listen, a Christian, a true Christian, is going to work hard at trying to please Jesus. Because, you know, I know things that he dislikes. I don't want to do the things that he dislikes. I know the things that he's inclined toward, the things that bring him pleasure. And I want to be a part of the things that bring him pleasure. The things that he delights in, I want to delight in. I want to follow after and... When he asks things of me, if I love him, should his commandments be burdensome to me? No, it ought to be a delight to me. I ought to find joy in doing what he asks me to do. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And the reason for that, when I even give up my own preferences of what, when, and where, is because I love him. Because he loved me first. 
If we love a person, don't we like his friends? Man, I had this pastor friend. We have known each other since college days. And uh, he called me up one day and said, Hey, Chad, I'm trying to get together a group of pastors. We all pastor kind of the same type of church, you know, older churches, seeking to take a next step all the time and scattered around the state of Texas. And he's a pretty good networker, and I'm really, I'm, I'm not heavily a networker. And he said, we're getting together for this retreat, and we'd love for you to come. The only person I knew out of this group of a dozen pastors was this guy. And I'm basically an introvert at the core of who I am. I think, oh man, I hate pastors. <laughs> My own free will, I wouldn't spend time with pastors. Uh, but I'm going to give this a whirl. And you know what? I got there, and here's what I found. These guys were all friends with the guy I was friends with. And the jump between how he was and how they were was a pretty short jump. And because we, we shared a lot in common, it's like we'd known each other our whole lives because the friends he picked out there, well, we had just a whole lot in common already from the day we started our relationship. And, and now, you know, I have a relationship with those guys when I'm not with him I'm, I'm in touch with them, and we're spending time together, and we're resourcing one another, encouraging one another, because, see, his friends are, turned out to be the kind of people that be really good friends for me, too. And they love the person that I love, this guy and this other pastor, and that was plenty of introduction. True Christians, true followers of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus' friends are my friends. And when I find another believer, we share in common the most precious thing that any relationship can be built upon. And we're part of the same body, the same family, the same army, heading to the same eternal home. That's just a whole lot to share in common with someone. And that makes them not so much a stranger as family. And I have an affection for believers wherever I find believers. And when I gather together with you, we have all kinds of different backgrounds. We're different ages. We're different cultures. There are lots of things that are different about us. When we get together, I love getting together at church. I love getting together in a small group, in a large group with other believers because we share in common Jesus that we love, the one we love. If we love a person, we're a little jealous about his name and honor too, aren't we? I mean, if you, love, you have a friend and somebody says bad things about them, you rise to their defense. They can't say things about them. That, that's your friend. That's someone special. You will guard their reputation. You want to guard the, their good name. And a true Christian has a godly jealousy for anyone who would, who would seek to uh, disparaging things about about our master's word, about his name, about his church, about his day. And we're sensitive to any dishonor brought upon him. And I'm not going to hold my peace on that. I'm not going to let that go unchallenged when someone challenges my Lord. I want to do it in love and with grace, but I want to stand up for Christ wherever I am and wherever I am because, because I love him. If we love a person don't we like to talk to them? Don't you like to tell them your thoughts, pour out your heart? I have a friend that, uh, one of my pastor friends, again, we go way back in time. And he's pastoring church uh, far enough away we can't get together often. But oh man, even if it's a phone call, but we'll, we will work out times to drive and meet somewhere or find something we can go and do together. And it's like, we were together yesterday. And I love to, it just energizes me when, when uh, phone, my phone rings and I pull out my cell phone. It's him on caller ID. You have people like that? You have people on caller ID that you go, ooh, man. Uh. <laughs> but they're those people that when their name shows up, you just get excited about it. Your heart beats a little faster. You're, you're so thrilled to be hearing their voice. 
whatever the conversation, because it's a much loved friend. A true Christian finds no difficulty speaking to the Savior every day. I have things I need to tell him about, and he wants to hear them. He has things he wants to tell me, and, and I want to hear his word for me. And if it's praying in the morning, praying at night, or those fire in a more complex time with the Lord, or it's firing off those sentence prayers during the day, I want to I want to talk to him when I need comfort and I want to talk to him when I'm afraid and I want to talk to him when I'm in trouble and when I need direction and I want to talk to him regularly and all that because I love him and I know he loves me. If you love a person, don't you always like to be with them? Wouldn't you like to be with them always? You know, my parents have, have lived a long way from us my whole married life and uh, I love talking to him on the phone. But my parents, two of the most fun people that I, I ever spend time with, and I love being with them. And when we get together, it just, we laugh and, and we tell stories. And it's such an encouragement to me, an encouragement to them. And, and I, I just love being with my folks. And when you belong to Jesus, don't you long for that day? Doesn't it start stirring within you when you really love Jesus that one day you're going to be with him in an uninterrupted fellowship for eternity? That's what heaven is when you're not, you're not struggling with sinning anymore. You're not having to think about repenting anymore. And believing is, is so real and so tangible. And you've begun this endless life and sin is no more. And, you know, we said we live by faith and not by sight. Man, for the day when we live by sight. I can live by faith and not by sight. But one day I will live by sight in heaven with the Lord I look forward to that day. And the reason I look forward to that day is because, because I love him. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Simon Peter, his most loyal disciple, denied any association with him three times. But the victorious, risen Jesus chose to appear to Peter. And engineered this strategy to extend mercy to Peter, to fully restore him, and restore him relationally. There's some things that really scrambled in his relationship with Christ, and those things needed to be restored. And there are things that needed to be restored vocationally. That calling that Jesus had originally given him, the, the authority Jesus had placed in his hands, that he would run with that, that it would count. And... Jesus gave Peter this fresh start by recreating his initial calling, feeding him, restoring him. And having sufficiently been fed by Jesus physically and spiritually, and Jesus calls him, feed my sheep. Now, three things to close out. To love the Lord is to follow him wherever he leads. Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Okay, we need an antecedent to a pronoun, right? Do you love me more than these? And the Bible doesn't tell us what these are. And lots of ideas about it, and probably it's not one of these. It's probably a combination of them all. Do you love me more than these? Again, remember the context. They're on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. They just pulled in all these fish. And maybe Jesus points to those other disciples. Do you love me more than these guys? Do you love me more than these buddies of yours? Or how about this? Do you love me more than the fishing business? Or do you love me more than having a stable life and uh, a steady income? Because business had never been better than it was at that moment. When Jesus said, do you love me more than this? Are you willing to follow me? Verse 19, Jesus used his favorite way to invite disciples. Follow me. He repeated that a little later on. Follow me. And it's a present tense command. Follow me and keep on following me. Don't turn back for a moment. Don't turn back for a season. Don't turn back for a day. Follow me and keep on following me. And from that day on, if you love me, Peter, follow me. And he invited Peter to follow in his steps 
which meant the gospel mission was going to be important to him and a holy life was going to be important to him. A lot of people say, I love Jesus. But if the hashtag uh, blessed, but if the direction of your life does not give evidence of that, we talked about the kids, you love your pet, but you know, if you watch them for two minutes, you ought to, well, yeah, they do love that pet. Or they, they really could care less about it. Th- those things would become evident. Same thing here. It becomes evident if you love Jesus. There are things that are important to you and there are things that are not. And if a dozen things are more important to you than Christ, and that is evident by how you do life, then here's the real hard truth of this passage. You don't love Jesus, no matter how much you declare it. Because it's not based on declaring it, it's based on what you do next. Do you love Jesus? And that's the measure, and that's what we have to ask every day. Did did I love Jesus today? The end of the day tomorrow, good evaluation. Did I love Jesus today? And would he say so? And would anyone else who walked around during the day with me, would they say, that's someone who loves Jesus? The things that are important to him, the things so clearly spelled out in God's word. If you follow, has there ever been a time in your life where you're closer to Jesus than you are right now? And if so, why is that so? Where, where did you drift? Where did you fall away? Where, where, did you, where did you lose your traction? Where did you get distracted? To love the Lord is to obey him whatever he asks. When Jesus first called Peter and the early disciples, he called them and he said, I have this job for you. It's fishing for men. And that is not unique to those guys. It's unique to everyone who names the name of Christ. If you're following, you're going to be on mission for him. Because there are too many people who are lost and going to spend eternity in hell. And, you know, you got to think, man, if I really love Jesus, I'm going to share Jesus' heart. And if I don't care about etern- eternal souls going into hell... Uh, maybe I don't love Jesus like I thought I did. Notice the progression of what Jesus says in this calling on Peter's life. Feed my lambs. Take care of the babies. The first word's lambs, the little ones. New believers need care, need nurture. Help them grow. Tend my sheep. And it expands on the first call to share. Now he's talking about the adults. Care for, and it's all their needs. Pasture, protection, <laughs> nurture. All their needs. And sometimes those needs are frustrating. Sometimes if you're caring for sheep, they smell like sheep. It's a messy work to take care of the sheep. And then feed my sheep. The little ones need to be fed, so do the older ones. Because we're not ever done making a disciple. I'm not ever done becoming a disciple. Living the life of a disciple. And uh, we're not ever done making disciples of others. It's a long-term commitment. Whatever task, whatever commitments Jesus called us to, if you love him, you will obey his commands. Even if, uh, like with Peter, Peter never imagined that uh, it'd just be a few weeks later that, that the Lord would be calling him to go into a Gentile home and share the gospel with people that he was supposed to stay away from, he thought religiously. Uh, because he'll lead you in places you never imagined. And then, to love the Lord is to trust him whatever the trial Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the road ahead for, for Peter. The way is going to be hard. There are going to be persecutions, trials awaiting you. He doesn't tell us uh, in, in the Bible, God's word doesn't share the details, but tr- church tradition is pretty strong that says Peter ended up in Rome at the end of his life, a prisoner of the Roman Empire, and they were going to execute him because of what he was doing as a disciple maker. And so they, they took him and they're going to crucify him because that was just their favorite way to execute anybody in Rome because they perfected the brutality of it. So they're going to crucify him and Peter says, you can crucify me, but please do not crucify me the way my Savior was crucified. Crucify me upside down because I do not deserve to be crucified the same way my Lord was crucified. And they crucified him upside down. Life's hard. And uh, for some of you, life is hard just now. And you, you begin to waver and you say, well, does God still love me? Has he forgotten me? Has he? And you know what? He never promised that uh, 
life be problem free if you're one of his followers. He never promised that you wouldn't, you wouldn't struggle with illness or you wouldn't struggle with relationship difficulties. You wouldn't struggle with uh, grief and loss because those things are a part of living in a broken world. But this is the message for us as it was for Peter. He doesn't sugarcoat those things, but he promises us he'll be with us and that God settles his accounts and some of those in eternity, but he settles the accounts. And we know that this life is short compared to eternity. Peter was teaching not long before that day in Jerusalem, but a day in uh, Rome when he would be executed. And he said to believers, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. You ever feel that? Man, life's difficult. What's, what's up with this? What a weird thing. Don't, be, don't act like it's something strange that's happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. When you love Jesus and you know he loves you, even when it's hard and the road is difficult, you can trust him. And here's why. Because he loves you. And in those times, don't waver. In your love for him. Do you love Jesus? Let's answer that really well.